Does this ever happen to you? In the dead of winter at 9 degrees outside? Well, of all times for the radiator to crack, Happy New Year everyone. Today I'll show you how to replace the engine radiator on a 1991 to 2001 Jeep Cherokee. On 87 through 90 models, it's the exact same process aside from the way the system is refilled due to not having a radiator cap. Models with other engines have a bit of a different setup, so this video only applies to 4 liter equipped Cherokees. The radiator is what actually cools the engine coolant. It's pumped through the upper hose here and makes its way across and down the cooling fins. As it trickles down, air from either ambiently driving or pulled from the fans is blown through it, which cools the liquid inside from about 210 degrees to vaguely 140. It's then pumped back through the engine, which keeps it from overheating. A radiator can fail in a few different ways. Firstly and most commonly, I find especially in cold climates they tend to crack, usually on the plastic end caps, which leaks coolant directly under your front bumper. With a leak in it, the radiator will still function properly, but you will eventually run out of coolant, and with low fluid in the system, things will overheat. Radiators can also leak from rusting out, so if yours is really rusty on the bottom, I'd consider replacing it before it actually dies. Secondly, radiators get clogged, either through once again rust, or from someone introducing foreign material in the cooling system, like stop leak. I do not condone the use of stop leak ever, not even in an emergency, because that stuff just clogs up everything and makes a huge mess. It will fix your problem in the short term, but you will need a new radiator every time you use it, as a radiator generally has the smallest and thus easiest to clog fluid ports. If your cooling system just isn't cutting it, among other things, replacing an old radiator might just do the trick. So, here's all the tools we're going to need for the job. You're going to need sockets from 8 to 13 millimeter, as well as a few random extensions. You will need a 3 fourths inch wrench and a crescent wrench, as well as uh, some pliers and a flathead screwdriver for whatever type of hose clamps the vehicle happens to have. You will interestingly need a quick disconnect set, specifically a 3 8 one, but you should just get a whole set. You are going to need about 2 gallons of coolant, either the 50-50 mix or you can mix it yourself. And if you have an automatic, you will need a little bit of transmission fluid. We're going to make use of a spill-proof funnel, highly recommended, and a regular funnel. Also got a bunch of paper towels because it is kind of a messy job. You are going to be replacing the radiator and you will need to replace the radiator cap if your new one does not include one. Now, I did not get a new radiator cap because I just kind of forgot about it oversight. I'll replace that later. It's not really that big of a deal. Also, optionally, you might want to get some new radiator hoses, the upper and lower hose, if those haven't been replaced in a while. But mine are only about a year old, so I'm not going to be replacing those either. As a form of preventative maintenance, whenever you replace the radiator, you should also replace the thermostat. I have a separate video delving into that linked in the description. First step is to drain the coolant out of the radiator. Now there is a petcock valve on the passenger side, but it drains so pathetically slowly and makes a huge mess. So instead, I'm going to drain everything by detaching the lower radiator hose from the water pump as I find that's the fastest way to do it. Because we need to remove the lower radiator hose anyway, to get a bit more room down here, I'll remove the air box by snapping off the cover and then removing the three half inch bolts on the bottom, securing it to the body. I'll next take out the electric fan if equipped by unplugging the connector and removing two eight millimeter bolts. It then lifts out of place. Next, take off the radiator cap. Now to remove the lower hose, but if we do that here, coolant is going to shoot all over the place up here, so instead I'll unplug it by the water pump. Because my past self put the hose clamp angled at the tensioner pulley bracket, I had to remove that in the power steering pump to get at it. Only three bolts hold each of those things on, so it's not bad. Next, I'll detach the mechanical fan shroud and just set it on the fan. Now we need to remove the radiator support, which is this black bar that runs across the top. There are only 10mm fasteners securing it, 3 bolts on either side, and 4 nuts on the back of the header panel. Despite many sources claiming otherwise, you do not need a Torx bit to remove this metal bar, nor do you need to remove the hood latch. 
You might need to at least loosen the battery to get at this one bolt over here, but conveniently that was the one bolt that broke off last time I did this, so that's cool. With the support bar out of here, we can start removing the lines and hoses going into the radiator. If you have an automatic transmission, there will be cooler lines running into the driver's side. A 19mm wrench will fit on the upper line, and if the whole fitting is twisting like this, use a crescent wrench to hold the back end steady. Make sure you don't twist the line when removing it, use PB if necessary. The lower line has a unique attachment mechanism with a small metal spring on 1995 and older models or a quick disconnect on 96 and newer XJs. Slide a 3 8 inch disconnect tool in place and pull the line off the fitting. You can see how this works by pressing in the four metal tabs inside it which lock around this ring on the edge. Note you'll also have to detach a small bracket on the bottom of the radiator. An 8mm bolt holds the upper transmission line there. You can then remove the upper radiator hose and the lower one. Next, if your Jeep has air conditioning, you need to remove two 10mm nuts mounting the AC condenser to the front of the radiator. With everything disconnected, the radiator then lifts out of place. On the top of the radiator are two rubber buffers that need to be transferred to the new one. I had to buy new nuts as the old ones just broke off. Now, making sure to note the dowel pins on the bottom go into their holes shared with the lower condenser brackets, lower the new radiator into place. Next, attach the two nuts for the condenser on the top. Attach the upper and lower radiator hoses. The lower transmission line simply snaps onto the new fitting, and the upper one needs to be carefully lined up. Don't cross-thread that sucker. Tighten the fitting to a decently tight, and then don't forget the small bracket on the underside. With the fan shroud resting in place, our next step is to put the radiator support back in. Try to align it with where it was before, noting the imprint outline of the bolts that attach it to the body. Put all the fasteners in loosely, do not tighten any of them yet. Snap the fan shroud into its slots at the bottom of the radiator, and then bolt it to the support bar. Now the electric fan is lowered into place, bolted down and plugged in. Don't forget to plug in the overflow hose, which I have decided to reroute because I find it inconvenient to have on top of the battery. It's at this point, after the fan and shroud have been bolted into place, that the support bar can be tightened down. If you removed the airbox earlier, go ahead and put that back in as well. Now, using a spill-proof funnel and the appropriate adapters, fill the radiator with coolant. You can shake the truck to potentially persuade some air out of it. Once the funnel stops draining, start the engine and keep it filled to at least halfway as the coolant is pumped through the system. It's also a good idea to run the heater while doing this. The Cherokees 4.0 requests a 50-50 mix of IAT coolant for 1987 through 2000 and 2001 models need a 50-50 mix of HOAT coolant instead. However, the green universal stuff works just fine in any of them. We're going to let the engine warm all the way to operating temperature, and once it gets there, the thermostat will open and let all the trapped air behind it out of the system. Make sure to keep an eye on the funnel and keep it full. While the last of the air is burped out, make sure the truck ain't going anywhere and put the transmission in neutral. Check the transmission fluid and add as necessary. You'll only usually lose about half a pint. Obviously, if you have a manual transmission, you don't need to worry about this part. When you're confident there's no more air in the system, shut off the engine and remove the spill-proof funnel using the stopper included with it. 
Then put on the radiator cap and fill the overflow tank to the correct level with whatever extra coolant you have. With that, go on a test drive, make sure the engine holds temperature, check for leaks, and then you're done. Once again, when replacing the radiator, you should also replace the thermostat, as well as the radiator cap. I have a separate video on the end card for the thermostat, and I promise I'll get a new radiator cap at the next opportunity. Definitely won't forget about it, or put it off or anything. I'll get right on it, don't worry.